presence. So we give more of ourselves. Thank you, God, that we can have service it's full of exciting times, exciting worship, exciting praise. But the heart of it is to get us involved, to get us engaged. For some of us, Father, we're at the place that the simple mention of your name brings us into your presence. But corporately, Father, it takes songs, it takes worship, it takes praise. He says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. And so, Father, we enter in with a high praise this morning. Hallelujah. Because you are God. Yes. We hear the music, and we hear the sound, but we hear the words. It's on the, on the, on the wings of the melody.
feel welcome. Shame on you. <laughs> welcome to the chapel at Antioch and welcome to the presence of the Lord. It is so good to see all of you all this morning. You know, last night we had a wonderful time here just for the part of the service where we praise and worship. You know, we see it. Um, if you have your Bibles, can we give Brother Kent Ford a hand for bringing the heat this morning? Get fired up. Get what anybody else going to say. Just get fired up for Jesus. That's how the church got started. Spiritual gifts, and I didn't pick it back up because the Lord gave me something else. And Wednesday, the Lord told me to go back to spiritual gifts and how to learn and all those things. And I want you to understand leadership because there are different functions of gifts. There's to follow the Lord. I need you to have that, that boldness that only comes from following trust Pastor Michelle to trust each other. Because there will be times for other people within this that when we get there. But for right now, I want you to open your heart to focus on the shepherd. I shall not want the leader. You will like no good thing. And I want this that us all follow the Lord. So that we can all be without lack. I don't want to be in lack. But it's a disease. And I don't want that disease. It's, it, it makes you uncomfortable when you can't feed, feed yourself. It makes you uncomfortable when you, you, your lights are off or your heat is off. And we don't want to go through it. And if we have the opportunity, it's our, it's our duty and our obligation to get before the Lord and let him lead us beside still waters. Have him restore our soul. Even though we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, by the way. Amen? So let's read this together. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. I'm reading from the King James Version. If you have it, say amen. amen. Let's read it together. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him all things which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joins together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I would really love to break down 16 but we're going to get down to later date because what that simply means is if you do your part and I do my part everybody gets to go up together and that's what I really want to get to as a church. We are not a church of, uh, of only people who follow Christ. We are believers in Christ. But we are also leaders in the earth. I believe God has called me to pass the leaders. So I need you to know how I see you. And if I hold you to a place of accountability, it's not because I believe you weak and dumb. It's because I believe that the potential to lead people is in you. So I'm not going to talk to you like you're a baby. I want to talk sometime to you sternly and you want to roll with me. because Not, not because your, your, your pastor is me. But no, I see leadership in all of you. Even Douglas, who is the youngest among us, I see leadership in Douglas. I see leadership. Howard back there, he can tell you that times I'm hard. Why? Because I see the potential. Education is not just speaking it to Lacey. Those of you all that are in education. Education is also pulling out. Sometimes it's hard to pull out because people don't know what's in there. But as a leader, I see what's in there and I'm going after it with everything in me. Why? Because that's what God needs in the earth to change things. There are things that are still in you, Valerie, that I got to pull out because there are things that you got to do. And I remember laying hands and praying for you last week. There are things that God told you you see. There are things God told you to do. And pull it out. That's why I brought you here. He bring you just so I can uh, soothe your soul and itch it is and all this stuff. No, you're going to heat me up. He put me in. You know, the Bible says in the last days they'll heap, heap up leaders and teachers for themselves, having itching ears. Where people just say what they want to hear. You know how many times people try to get me to just say, Pastor, you should just talk about this. I said, well, you should just be God. Then I listen to you and stop listening to him. Can you help me? Get out of my face with that. Father, we thank you for your word. It's already blessed. I have decreased that you may increase. Father, today, speak your word. Speak your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, gentlemen, for your wonderful uh, gifts. You guys, bring. We're so grateful to have you. Good to have my buddy Matt back. I was here. Oh, you know what? I got to do it before. You know what? I'll get into it. I'll get into it. I'll get into it. All right. So today we're going to talk about the spiritual gifts, part two, the fivefold ministry. So 
we've talked about this in depth before. I mean, not in depth. We've talked about it a little bit on the surface before. The fivefold ministry gifts given for the perfected church. Ephesians 4 plainly says, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Can we agree? Can you all remember these fivefold ministry gifts? These are callings. These are callings. These, everybody say this. Say, these are callings. These are all right, so you ready? Apostle. Say it with me. Apostle. Apostle. Prophet. Evangelists, pastors, teachers, evangelists, pastors, teachers. All of these are callings, but let me say this. They are fundamental. They must exemplify the qualifications of an elder according to Paul's likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, fivefold ministry gifts. You must exemplify or display, constantly uh, uh, um, uh, project or present the, the, the qualifications of an elder. Now, historically, the elder meant someone who was of old age. You have to understand, knowledge was limited. Exposure to knowledge was limited. So you learn by experience. So the person at that time with the most experience was the smartest person. Well, things have changed in our generation. Things have changed by the time Jesus comes on the scene. And Jesus brings the Holy Ghost who brings all things to your remembrance. Now we have access to the supernatural realm that we didn't have access to before. So it doesn't mean you have to be the oldest. You just got to be in tune with the, with the Holy Spirit. And so you display that. I'll prove it. Speak those things which become sound doctrine. If you're speaking by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, that's sound doctrine. That the aged men be sober. If you're young and you're elder, I think I was, an elder, I think I was ordained an elder when I was 25 years old. But I had sound doctrine. I was sober. I was grave. The word grave there means honorable. Not just in the church, but in the community. Temperate. Self-control, that's all it means. You got to have some self-control. Without self-control, you ought to, man, sound in faith. In other words, I mean, you, you can publicly see my display of faith, right? That leads to charity, which means love. I think I tell y'all, I love y'all. Every time I see you, I love you, I love you. I tell you sometimes 15 times in one setting. And I mean it every time. I was an elder before I was a pastor. And so some of you all are gaining that reputation that's going to position you as elders before you're old. That's good. That's not a bad thing. It's not that I'm going to ordain you an elder as some do in their denomination. I'm just telling you that for God to use you, you got to display some signs of an elder. The Bible says don't let a novice or a newcomer be a teacher. They don't know enough. And so you're learning things that's putting you in eldership. But notice here when he says aged men, he also goes to aged women, which negates the fact that women can't lead. Because in Titus' letter, he says let the elder men know, but also let the elder women know. They got to do all that. Then there are some things he didn't say that the men have to do, but because of likewise, it's inclusive to the point. So the aged women likewise, they be, um, and so the women cannot be false accusers. I don't, I don't know what that means, ladies, but maybe y'all can figure that. That's a joke, of course. Teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands. So, to love their husbands, to love their children. You didn't know that you had to be taught how to love your children. You think you just have a child and all of a sudden you love. Do you know this is why doctors are making tons of money? Because if they're medicating people, oh, you have depression. Oh, you postpartum. No, somebody needs to teach them how to love their children. Just because you have a baby don't mean you know what to do. That's the dumbest misconception that's going on. That's my child. That says you can't handle children. And you need to be, a, you need to be taught how to love your children. And I'll say that to you. You can learn how to love your children. We can teach you everything that the Bible says about children, parenting. You really don't know until you get one. Ooh, them little jokers. Oh, there are days that you just want to strangle them little jokers. They cute when they crying and you cleaning up their mess. But when they get 15 and you got to still do that, oh my goodness. Andrea is nodding her head. No, already. Watch this. Does that mean men don't have to be keepers of the home? No! 
He working like a dog and you spinning like a puppy. It can't happen. Because you know puppies cost more to keep up. Something. We got young people here. I want y'all, I don't want y'all to, I don't want y'all to think that, that I got this idea that it's all gonna be. Listen. All this stuff right there, I'm mean, gonna help all y'all out, all you young, especially young people. Because see, the, the world is trying to make y'all stupid. See, this is how y'all learn. Y'all really into it now can feel y'all. There's no app for that. <laughs> There's no app for any of this. This is a matter of the heart. And if you're going to be used by God, there ain't no app for that. Oh, I'm just going to get the app, Chase app. I'm going to get the Chase app. I'm going to get the Keep Up Home app. The discreet app. It ain't there. You ain't going to find it. What you're going to find is the Kim Kardashian app. Which is going to take you away from chastity. Which is going to take you away from sexual purity. Which is going to take you away from wholeness and staying at home. Do you know number two, two, two things that people divorce over? What do y'all think it is? Money. Money, number one. What do you think the other one is? Six. Infidelity. Money and infidelity. Two reasons, two major reasons, and then they then they get to the court. And the court's so sick of saying them. The court that made up irreconcilable differences. This is calling that. Y'all, y'all can't figure this out. Nope. Divorce. But I like what the judge said. Has this marriage been consummated? See, our young people got this notion that marriage is the way. No. Marriage is said, let the two become one flesh. It's only one act in the whole world by which two become one. That's marriage. So you have to ask yourself, while you're working towards leadership, are you in a position to be one with God? Or have you already been one with man? Because the Bible says, he that is unmarried is given to the things of the Lord. While he that is married is given to the things of his wife. And she that is married is given to the things of her husband. And so we have to find out where we really are. And if we're not where we should be, we need to repent so that we can get back on track so that God can trust us with spiritual gifts. I was blessed by Mother Aida. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let's talk about the teacher. I'm going to work up back, backwards. I know it's the Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Pastor, and Teacher. But I'm going to start with the teacher because the teacher is the most un, underrated gift in the five-fold ministry. You have people who are apostles, but they can't teach. That don't make sense. That just, that's backwards. You've been called of God for two months and all of a sudden you're ready to lead the nation. That's dumb. The church is the only place a person can be a doctor but never have extensive studies. <laughs> he doc that's doctor so-and-so. He got his doctor offline. That's offline. That's like a clothesline. WWE. Go, go hang yourself. No, I'm for real, guys. Spirit. Kid Ford sent me something last night. I only, I can't. Kid Ford sent me something last night. Watch the TV. What are you gonna heal from? What are you gonna do? Uh, no, no. Hold on. Kid, trying to look it up. He's going to uh, for nineteen ninety five. Listen to this. He's going to heal you from cancer and cancel all your debts. <laughs> could you imagine if nineteen ninety five could do it? For $20, I could go clear out a whole cancer ward? See, that's, that's wrong teaching. Now, I will say this. Faith in God can do all the above. But he don't need 1995. How you get it down to that number? <laughs> See, sound teaching is everything, guys. And a lot of these guys grew up under preachers who, who, who were uh, emotional leaders. If I can get down into your heart with a good line, oh God, I can move you to give me $19. You're going to get healed today. And they go, yes! <laughs> yes! And then the choir come in, yes! And you out there, yeah, y'all, you laughing, but that's it, you give me 19, give me 19. That's sensationalism. And it's not that I'm against the art of preaching because it's also an art to preaching like that. But you got to first be a teacher. In Matthew 28, 16 through 20, it says this way. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Notice this. 
They were appointed a location. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. The teacher is given room to doubt. You see that? Watch. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Teachers must be appointed a location. So this is why in church you have youth teachers, children's teachers, uh, men's teachers, women's teachers. They are appointed to somewhere. So if you have a call to be a teacher, you're going to have to submit so that somebody can put you where you're supposed to be. Because the teacher is the one area where doubt may pop up that won't hinder everybody. Listen, at this level of my life, and at this position I'm in in your life, you don't need me to be doubting y'all. I'm the pastor. If I doubt, what you going to do? Well, y'all, I don't know if God wants us to be blessed. But what you got? What? You want you to encourage me now? Come on. So the teacher is allowed to question some, some things. And then Jesus comes along and straighten it out. I love the way he does this. He says, go and teach all nations. Even with my doubts, Lord, yeah, you're just a teacher. Ain't nobody going to expect much out of you. Go ahead. Get, get out there. Try it out. You want to know how to increase in your gift? Start teaching what you believe. Right where you at right now, just start teaching. Well, I learned in church Sunday, five-fold ministry gifts, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers, they was all given for the perfecting of the saints. If you ain't got no more than that, just stick with that. Don't feel no responsibility to break down the Hebrew and the Greek. You don't know that. Teach what you know. Then that begins to become how you talk. That begins to be how you speak, how you live. You're a teacher now. Here's some signs of a teacher. You ready? They're appointed to a certain area. They, they are teachable, must have the qualifications of an elder. They are anointed to teach. A good teacher is a student of the Word of God, and they have a passion for the Word of God. I'll give y'all a moment. If I don't get through all five of these today, y'all will be all right? Will y'all be all right? All right. They must be sound in doctrine. Teachers build up. They don't tear down. When you go to the military, there is a guy who's there. It's called boot camp. He's not a teacher. He's a drill instructor. He's there to tear you down. But what he does is when he's done breaking your body down, he sends you to, to the next level. And then that teacher begins to build you back up. In the kingdom of God, the world had already beat you down. That's why you came to the altar on your knees. Cry. Lord, help <laughs> Now, the teacher is to build you up. The teacher is open for fresh glimpses of truth from the Word of God. I was, I was going to talk about this. Well, I will in some days when I first asked the Lord, what does it mean to seek you? He says, be willing to forget what you think you know to accept truth. A good teacher is willing to forget what they learned from their last denomination to accept God's truth. Because the truth of God is cross-denominational. It doesn't matter what denomination you're in. Jesus Christ should be Lord. God should be Father and the Holy Spirit is a comforter. If your denomination has taught you something other than that, you run. It's just some fundamental truths that just go across the board. And then you today you got people arguing stuff. So Jesus was black or Jesus was Jew. Jesus was white with blonde hair and blue eyes. Look. Let me put him on a cross. Did he bleed red blood? Yeah. That's all I need to know. I do know he's Jewish. That's the truth. <laughs> I saw y'all. Y'all can see. Let me tell y'all. My gifts are on, man. Let me tell y'all right now. I'm so on. I, I felt that thing out of the well. I ain't going to leave you confused. If you look down the lineage of Jesus Christ on both his mother and, and his, um, his biological mother and Joseph, both lineages come down from the, from the Jewish Jewish nations, okay? And just like with any other adopted child, he takes on the name of his father. When Jesus walked through the city, they said, hey, isn't that Joseph, the carpenter's son? It was when he said, I'm the son of God. Blasphemy. <laughs> they would be killed. <laughs> Y'all ready to go on to the next one? The pastor. The pastor.
pastor is the shepherd. Jeremiah 3 says it this way, and I will give you pastors according to mine own heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, said the Lord, they shall say no more the art of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. The, 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 if the children of Israel were led by the Ark of the Covenant, you know that the Ark of Covenant is the thing that, that the gold, wood, gold, late, most holy place, to cherubim, holy, 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 you got it. The function of the pastor is no different than the function of the Ark. But because the gospel is spreading and there's only one Ark, he says, I got to give you pastors. I got to give you people who carry the anointing, who make sure that the atmosphere is holy, 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 and put a place where I can show up with the Shekinah glory and be God. So that's when we're having times of worship. Without a pastor, you don't have that. God is the greatest pastor of all times. David said it in Psalms 23. The pastor is a shepherd of the people. Must have the qualifications of an elder. He must feed the people with knowledge and understanding. Feed the people with knowledge and understanding. I just can't sit here and tell you a whole bunch of scriptures. That's what church has done to us in the past. Scripture memorization. Just Don't you remember it? Yeah, but I don't know what to do with it. What good is a scripture that you can't understand? Nothing. nothing it's good for nothing. So I'd rather teach you a few scriptures and get you understanding so that you can begin to understand scriptures while you read it at home. This is why I preface, like when I say this came from the book of Matthew. You know, this book was written by Paul to Titus, Timothy. You know that. And you should start developing that when you're studying, when, you, when you're talking about the gospel. If you're reading one of uh, Paul's letters, you should preface it. Paul wrote in his letter to Timothy. Paul wrote in his letter to Philemon. Paul wrote to the Galatian church. Why? Because it helps your understanding. Pastors are equipped supernaturally. Valerie broke that thing down so well a couple weeks ago in Fast 40 when Asa asked the question, Pastor D, it's like you have all of these gifts. And I said, this is true, but I don't walk in the office of a prophet. I don't walk in the office of an apostle. Why? Because God is putting these things in me to do supernaturally until we raise people up. Because what he says, in those days, I will give you pastors. So I'm training up people to walk in those things. And when you begin to walk out your calling, then it won't be necessary for me to walk in that. Now I can shepherd you in that. I'm your pastor. The pastor gives his life for the people. Now is that a sacrifice that's equivalent to Jesus? No way. No. But when you all are out bowling, I'm still praying. And guess what? You okay for bowling, but I gotta be praying. And guess what I'm praying for? You that's out bowling. Isn't that crazy? And I can't come in and say, so you've been bowling again, huh? We sure needed you painting. If you ain't have it in your heart to come help paint, you ain't got it in your heart. I can't make you come paint. Guess we got to show up and paint. I got to show up and paint. It's time to feed the homeless. We're going to put it out there to everybody. We want to feed the homeless. Well, Pastor, I already got my penny pitching contest going on. Okay. <laughs> You're going to be pitching pennies while we feed the homeless. All right. God bless you. Oh, my cousin gets a toe amputated. Okay. You want to save cousin? I hope you're over there with your Bible. No, we're just going gonna to help her through this. All right. Right. Can't be mad at you, I'm a pastor. I've given my life. Michelle has given her life. Y'all are really tripping on that, right? I get it. Any questions about that? Because I can hear questions popping off in your heads. Any questions? I'm so cool right now. Valerie, you got one? Go ahead. Why do some pastors make you feel um, like, I don't know what uh, They kind of use that as to intimidate you. I think it's I think it's when we were and I can say this from a pastor's perspective our sacrifice is really great 
And sometimes people get offended when they think or compare it to themselves. See, I can't compare you to me. You're not a pastor. So I have to be here. But I realize you, you don't have to be here. Now, I will say this. I'm going to help all y'all. If you want to keep a pastor from being like that, don't overcommit. Don't say you'll do something and then not show up to do it. Now, that's frustrating. Then that's when they typically open up, you ain't a man of your word. You was out chasing dogs at the dog show and we over here praying for the sick. You heathen. What they're really saying is, you told me you was going to be at the prayer meeting and you didn't show up. And so I planned a prayer meeting for two hours, but then it ended up just being me. Now I'm exhausted, I'm in pain because I gave so much of myself thinking that I would have you there with me. So if you want to keep your pastor from being frustrated, don't overpromise. I learned it a long time ago, the power of saying no. Just tell me no, I can deal with no. But don't lie to me and then don't show up. That's hard. Josh. And I feel like it's also like the more you know and step into you know, what God is calling you to and what you're doing with you, you understand that's where your time goes into. So like you being a pastor, that's what you're putting your time into and, and all that prayer is, is building up to that. But me being in a position when I'm doing, I'm spending a lot of my time working on music, working on so that God can use me in that. If I spent all of my life praying and work, not working on music at all, I wouldn't better that gift at all. Bingo, which was going to be my second piece. Once we all start working on what God has called us to do, we don't have these struggles because, once again, I go back to 16 of Ephesians 4. If everybody do what they're called to do, then we are growing together. And so what happens is pastors get frustrated because of this imbalance. It seems like he's pulling the people along all by himself. And that's very frustrating. So some pastors do. Some do it out of ignorance. And then some do it out of character flaw. They just mean. <laughs> they, just, they just mean. Everybody going to hell with them. <laughs> it's just, it's just me. And that's old school. That's the old school way of doing it. You know, you know, in some circles and some denominations, they believe in cracking the whip as if it's uh, a system by which people want to be around you. I just, I remember when my mother was whipping me. I didn't want to go and hug her. I don't want to be. I don't love you right now. And so I don't understand how people would expect the church to grow if they're always cracking the whip. You know, the pastor leads. He has. Both, what did David say God used? Thy rod and thy staff. They do what? Comfort. Say it again. Thy rod and thy staff comfort. What? The chief shepherd has a rod. Y'all know what the rod is for? The rod is for correction. But do you know what the staff is for? The staff is for rescue. They're comforted in knowing we can be both corrected and rescued. That should be comforting. Some people resist that. What you got that rod for? I don't need no rod. I'm a grown man. <laughs> well, you sure don't act like it all the time. Pastors see that. So I hold both the rod and the staff as a pastor. The rod is a straight, shorter uh, thing. We use it when we're going up mountains. The rod, the rod helps us to get to tough places together, Right? Because when the sheep get out of order, the rod is, hey, get back in line. The other sheep typically see that, and they say, I don't want none of that. <laughs> but the staff is for when the sheep gets someplace too far to reach. And instead of the shepherd scaring the whole bunch, he just extends the staff, and it's the one with the curve. And he guides them back in. And then he gets them over here to safety. Or if he's jumped up too high, he pulls them down. If he's down too low, he pulls them up. But the fact that the pastor has the staff and the rod should bring comfort. And you'll see that you'll see that model throughout every one of these gifts. The pastor has oversight of the local flock. He operates in the gifts of the spirit, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. All flow through pastors. They must be exemplary of a leader to follow. If you have a leader that you don't want to follow, maybe you should not be following that leader. And once again, I'm not talking about just you guys in the room. Please understand, there are people who watch us from afar that I must speak this to as well. If you have a pastor that doesn't exemplify things that you want to do or follow or be, please leave. It's a detriment. You're going to talk about it. You're going to build up anger. You're going to eventually stop going to church and you're going to find yourself frustrated at home having this war, knowing that you're supposed to be in church but you're out of church because you let this nut get you out of place. And it's not worth it. It's your soul. 
The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of the flow of the issues of life. You got to protect you. Can I get an amen? amen. Y'all are quiet. This public library. Y'all know this used to be a, a whites only school. Y'all know this used to be a music conservatory? This building. So they've always made noise in this building. Don't be so quiet. That was my point. And it's paid for. <laughs> amen. You heard me also say amen. 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 The evangelist, 2 Timothy 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall keep up to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. The evangelist has a responsibility. Their primary message is to preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The evangelist always reminds people, how do we get back to Jesus? But notice, the people will heap up for themselves teachers. The evangelist often has to come in and correct what teachers have messed up. The evangelist may have to come in and say, this guy that you all got in front of y'all is not a man of God. Well, he a man of God. Well, you out of order. The evangelist typically travels. In some denominations, they only allow women to be. That's the furthest that a woman can go is an evangelist. It's not looked upon in the hierarchy of some denominational moves because it's a traveling ministry. It's a reproof or a gospel only. I think that's kind of relegated, but that's not biblical, guys. It's not biblical. We want to stay with the word of God. Because, watch this. In those same denominations, women weren't allowed to preach. But he says, do the work of the evangelist. But right here it says, preach the word. Oxymoronic. How do they do? I do not want to do one without doing the other. Women can't preach what? It's right there, dummy. You made an evangelist that'll preach. Now we're going to stick it down there with the women's ministry. She can't usurp authority over a man. Dumb, dumb. This is the spirit of dumb. Every man ever born was under the authority of a woman. Now you think about it. Hello. As my godmother would say, hello world. Every man ever born, including Jesus, was under the authority of a woman. Unless he alien. You can't prove that either, can you? Good night. The woman has the womb. You think, you, how many y'all think Jesus didn't get no whoops? Just as a thought. The Bible will tell us whether he did or not. But I would like to see Jesus just get a spanking. Could you imagine what that would have been like? No, no, no. I'm talking about for his mom. Now you go being deep. <laughs> That's why I'm going to preach. See, you got something. <laughs> Go for it, Suzanne. Suzanne, you got a question. Come on. I, think I, I, said, I don't think he did because he was without seatbelt. Well, I was getting frustrated. Let me help Suzanne. I second that. I, I thought y'all, praise God for y'all wonderful people. Praise God. I'm going to give y'all another scripture. You ready? Thank you, Kevin. Say it again. So, you ready? The Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. So it's highly probable that Jesus did some foolishness yeah. at some point. It's his problem. But you're right, he was without sin. Which also is a really good point, Suzanne. Very good question. Which helps us understand young people even better. Sometimes for the young, they get away with stuff that those that are older shouldn't get away with. Because they're children. That's right. 
And I'm tired of older people holding children to a higher uh, standard than their children. I see you smiling over this. Children make mistakes. Think about it. From zero to five, they're learning the language. From five to ten, they're learning how to use the language or comprehend the language. From, from ten to fifteen, they're learning what to do with it. But yet, we got to make them act like grown-ups. They're not that bright. We got to be merciful with them. Think about your job. If you had five years to learn your job well, and then after that, the expectation was that you'd be a supervisor level, and if not, you get fired. What's the first thing you're going to say when they come to the board meeting? You've been in five years. You should be able to run the whole company. Huh? <laughs> Y'all haven't taught me all that. That's how kids look sometimes. We at the school, the kids look like. We had a situation the other day in Michelle's classroom. Little boy was brought to tears. Another kid accused him of cursing. He cursed. I didn't curse. I didn't say that. He yelled at me. He said, I heard him. He said, But I didn't mean to go. So I didn't know I didn't do it. What did you say? What did you say? OMG. That's religion. The kid said, OMG. And because somebody had taught their kids in their home, that was a curse word, they persecuted this kid for saying OMG. And he fell back. He was confused because in his home, OMG wasn't the curse word. But in their home, they just gonna make everybody OMG is a curse. Well, how do you say the alphabet without OMG? <laughs> so in itself. Just stop it. See, this is the evangelist. What you're seeing is me being the evangelist. <laughs> You see it? The evangelist is just like, chow, 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 boom, like Kung Fu Master with the word. We bring things to a common place because if our kids can't say the name of Jesus, like how are they going to seek him out? According to some denominations, to say the name God and to say the name Jesus is a violation of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not speak the Lord's thy God, thou shalt not take the Lord's thy God name in vain. That's simple to understand. Do you take this woman to be your wife? Now she's taking your last name. Don't take on the name of God if you're not going to live out the plan of God. That's all he's saying. It has nothing to do with your oral presentation of God. The Jews honored God to that way because they were in fear. But the Bible plainly says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but that of power, love, and a sound mind. Peter is going down and he reaches up and he says one word, Jesus. But according to some denominations, he'd be, you're using the Lord's name in vain. So what are you going to do, drown? Do you see how we messed up stuff over the years? Well, the Jews never said his name because they were in fear. But the Jews also was in idolatry. What you going to do with that? They wouldn't even write it. His name was so holy. But God told Daniel, write the vision. Make it plain. That they may run, may see it and run with it. Could you imagine trying to figure out what that said? Let's be the evangelist. Let me go on to the next slide. <sighs> See that? I just did all that. I just did all that right there. And the truth, y'all pulled it out of it. The evangelist, he reproves, he tells the faults, he gives correction, then he brings comfort. Because at the end of the day, when the little boy was told OMG was a cuss word, Miss, 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 Miss Cobra had to come back and say, Well, baby, that's in your house. And the kid dried his tears. Thank you. <laughs> Could you imagine if some of the stuff you learn in church you can get free from? You going to hell for weighing that shirt? What in the world? <sighs> See, I got. Let me tell y'all. Over the years, I've operated in many of these functions. See, when people get on. <laughs> See, what you're really saying is, you can't take sin what I wore, so therefore, for your sake, I shouldn't wear that. But let's make it a rule. The Bible says, for a man to wear a woman's garment is an abomination, and for a woman to wear a man's garment is an abomination. Now, you have to understand that when God broke down the instructions to the Levites, 
there were certain textures that the men were supposed to wear to come before the Lord that the women could not wear coming before the Lord. The men were never to mix garments. Wool and linen were never to be mixed. So there were certain things that weren't supposed to be done. But even as it relates to a covering, if you go and if we're going to hold to the, to the scriptures, the Bible says do not build the altar upon stairs unless your nakedness be exposed. So if men could go on the altar, what kind of outfit did they have? Now, what do pants think about it? Just think about it. For a man to get on the altar and his nakedness be exposed, what kind of outfit did he have on at that time? Something that probably looked like a dress. So to say that the women wear dresses and men wear pants, that ain't, you can't back that up with scripture. Or you got to tear down your altar. And we all got to, you got to preach from the same level. Speak for real, guys. The Bible talks about being chaste. Remember all the qualifications of an elder. You got all the qualifications. An evangelist must be chaste. Please, if you got a ministry to evangelize, don't go out with your bosom and your thighs and all that stuff out. Don't go out with your, <clears throat> your workout clothes. I'm going to preach. And you got a workout tights. Come on now, stop it. Unless you're teaching yoga, I mean not yoga, unless you're teaching fitness in a studio or something like that, then that's different. I would love to see that. I'm teaching ministry, working out. The saints could use that, couldn't they? Huh? Do what you say, Morgan? Amen. <laughs> the evangelist preached Jesus, must have the qualification of an elder. Evangelist, the ministry of an evangelist, often when I'm doing missionary work, I'm doing the work of an evangelist. Miracle signs and wonders often follow the evangelist. I told you all why miracles and signs and wonders happen last week. Who remembers? Why does miracle signs and wonders occur? For the it's for the unbeliever, but why? Uh, You're so right. It follows the preaching of the gospel. Yes, it follows the preaching of the gospel. Very good. It follows the preaching of the gospel. Whenever the gospel is preached, miracle signs and wonders follow the preaching of the gospel. That's why we had the manifestation we had last week. I preached the gospel, and then people got broke free of fear. I know some of y'all was humming that song all week. That's all week. Why? Because it was your deliverance. And you can sit back and say, man, I remember the day, the second Sunday in February, I got free of fear. Why? Because the word was preached. Salvation is the simplest form. The evangelists make sure that people understand salvation in the simplest form. They preach the word of God. Primary message is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For the evangelists, everything pretty much comes back to that message. This is where it gets crazy. The prophet. 1 Corinthians 14. Follow after charity, the desire of spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Paul says to the Corinthian church, if you want to be effective today, I need you to desire prophecy. Be able to prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth, and how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. Sounds just like the teacher. Sounds just like the pastor. Sounds just like the evangelist. They speak unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. The prophet is inspirational. It just means inspired speaker. When God lays something in your heart, you speak it. Now, I'm going to tell you guys. I am not a prophet, but I operate in the gift of prophecy. There are times God will speak something directly to me, and I'm able to repeat what he says. I can't take no glory for that. There are times in your life I may say, this is what I hear God saying. That's called a word of knowledge, okay, or a word of wisdom based on experience. The word of knowledge is based on God's divine revelation through his scripture or his voice. The word of wisdom is based on experience and application. Am I talking too fast? No. I am? Okay, let me slow down. I'm fired up. I'm going to wait on you. <laughs> oh. The prophet is the inspired speaker. He must have the qualifications of an elder. Edification, which means build up and confirm. So you, that means you need to, for, for a, a word of prophecy. Let me, let me ask y'all this. Are you ready? Why y'all right? You open this not yet. For a word of prophecy to effectively minister to you, you must have something to work with before the prophecy comes. Prophecy should not be a surprise. Prophecy should be a confirmation to what God has already said to you. And what typically happens is when people get a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom from someone who is a prophetic voice, if they haven't been before God, they doubt that what they just heard was even applicable to them. I don't know about all that. You're right. You don't know about all of that. 
And what you should do is know about all that. You should have direction for your life concerning God. I love, I love, I love last night when we were here praying and Mother Ada says, Pastor, let me tell you something. I said, what is it, Mother? I love when she talks to me. Your mother just, your mother excites me. I said, I can't help it. I said, what is it? She says, I've been reading Jeremiah and I've been meditating on it. And I tell you what, Ada's no prophet. <laughs> she said, I'm no prophet. I said, huh? And I was sitting back there. I said, wait, I got up. Remember, I got up. I said, tell me more. How does she know she's not a prophet? Because she meditated on God's word. I was taught this. I heard this. And I want you all to know this. What does it mean to meditate on God's word? Because as you seek out God and, and, and look for this, what, how do you know how to meditate? How do you know how long to meditate on God's word? I'm going to give you a, this will bless your life, all of y'all. You meditate until what you're meditating on speaks back to you. That's what mother said last night. I meditated on God's word, and this is what I've discovered. I am a nurturer. I am a caregiver. I'm given the hospitality. I am good with nurturing. Why? She was meditating on what am I to be doing in this time in my life, Lord? And she looks at the prophet Jeremiah, and she sees all that he goes through, and then all of a sudden, she's, that's not you. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah did not want to go tell the people what God had. He didn't want to go. From the beginning. Jeremiah, before I fall near the mother's womb, I've been your prophet to the nation. I've been blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I can't go. <laughs> what in the world? He says, my lips, I'm a man of unclean lips. I come from a people of unclean lips. He just stopped making excuses. And all through scripture, you see Jeremiah crying, y'all, weeping, crying. I won't go tell him that, Lord, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go tell him. That is definitely not you. Because when you hear from God, you care so much. He says, I just want you to know I hear from God. And this is what he's saying. I, I, like, the way, I like the way you walk off. Huh? <laughs> it's on you. It's not on me. I told you what the Lord said. But the prophet builds up, he confirms, exhorts, he encourages to righteousness. Comfort, consolation. Not infallible. Not infallible is important. Because you can't hold the prophet to a 100% correction rate. To do that is to make him something he can never be. Can a prophet make mistakes? Yes. Ask Jonah. Prophets can blow it. And let me tell you, there are some prophetic gifts that are holding on by a thread that are using pranks and manipulation even today. Because they no longer carry the anointing. The gift is there. But the anointing to prophesy God's will accurately. They've created these lifestyles for themselves. That are dependent upon them having so much money a month. That now they got to sell prophecy. Now they got to call people. Man I'm in town. I need to come over there. Man I got a word for your church. You ain't got no word. Say whatever you have. Speaking through the phone. I'm going to put you on speaker. Because when they get there now they got to take up an offer. They always feel they to take up an offer. Love. love, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do a love offering. The prophetic has been so strong today. No, you're a lie. Your debts are building up. You haven't been home in months because you've been traveling. You ain't had no time to spend with the Lord. You have no time to be inspired by God. So now you're just warming up stuff. You just repeating prophecy. They got one prophet last year. He was out prophesying with a piece of paper. I wish I could show y'all that video. He prophesied with a piece of paper. Then they, the guy who did the video slides to this, um, what you call it? Fortune teller. A witch or a prophet, a witch, false prophet. She was saying the same prophecy. I mean, a fortune teller. Same exact messages. Did y'all see that last year? Prophet Brian Kahn. I call him Brian Carnality. Carnality. Because he carnal. I've seen him in person. He's a very carnal man. He comes to my mother's church once a year. Sometimes two or three times a year based upon how much money he needs. And it's the same prophecies every, every time. And the people that got so used to it, guys, I'm telling you, it's a detriment. People come in with their bills. 
They come to church with their bills. And he has a gift out of this world. Notice, I didn't, I didn't knock his gift. But it's, it's, it's not anointed. It's manipulative. He can say stuff like, your bill is $422.11. Your last name is Carl. Where you at? I'm right here. He, he got to get it. But you better believe. Now you need to sacrifice. I know you got that four hundred dollar bill, but what you need to do is believe God, because God will bless you with four hundred thousand. See, but you need to give a thousand a day. Now let's just break this down. They got a four hundred dollar bill, but they need to give a thousand. They could have paid their bill. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? They could have paid their bill. But because you didn't treat them with the, the possibility of having 400000 now they don't go pay their bill. They gave a 1000 that they didn't have, and they still got the bill with interest. Waiting on the 400 Oh, my change is coming. You better believe it. You're going to be in the dark. They're going to turn the lights off because you didn't pay that bill. Can you, can you break that down furthermore? Like, okay, so he has his gift. The Bible says that the gifts of God are not without repentance. So God is not an Indian giver. Once he gives you a gift, it'll work. It'll, it'll work. No matter what you do with it, it's your gift. God doesn't force you to use your gift for his service. So the gift of prophecy is definitely on it. No doubt about it. What you like understanding is, how is it that he can still operate in the church? Because somebody has to be an apostle and say no. Somebody has to say your prophecies are not lining up with the, with the result of the people. Remember, how do you know a prophet is a prophet? Under the unction of God, what happens? The prophecy comes to pass. If the prophecy don't come to pass, you may be gifted. But if it don't come to pass, it ain't no name of God. See, when I'm operating under, this, under the Spirit of the Lord and prophecy comes upon me, if I say some destiny, your shoes about to turn purple. I see purple in the spirit. What did I just say to you? I didn't tell you your shoes were about to turn purple. You misinterpreted. What did I say? Where? In the spirit. See how people listen? I said in the spirit. And so what they do is they manipulate you with that. And now if you ain't wise, you just heard the shoes gonna turn purple. So you at home looking for purple shoes, but this joker that manipulated you and it cleared itself by saying in the spirit. But well, we can't see up there. <laughs> we, <laughs> we can't see in the spirit. We need to see in the earth. So how does it manifest in the earth is more important than what you saw. The Bible talks about them in the book of Jeremiah. They dream dreams and they have scattered the sheep and they made the people. It's in Jeremiah Jeremiah. Three, I believe. So the gift still works, but it's manipulative. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm loving this, though. I'm going to tell y'all that right now. Andrea, you had your hand up. Yes, prophets see things because God showed them what's to come. So yes, prophets, for the majority, prophets use the word of God coupled with visions and dreams to interpret to people, to bring um, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Yes, I'm trying to find it here, Destiny. I want to make sure I, I lead you right where it talks about the, the um, prophets have caused the sheep to scatter the um, it was a prophet's fault because they was dreamers of dreams and they was giving out false, just lying. Somebody else had their hand up. You got it, Michelle? Um, so basically, if, so if he's, if the prophecy is your shoes are going to turn purple, it's going to be like, I'm listening. You know what I'm saying? Like, the prophecy is the spirit, I see your shoes are going to turn purple. The prophecy and the explanation would be, and this means X, Y, Z, that's for you. And that would be how you know that the prophecy is going to turn purple. Yes. Because he would give you an interpretation of what he's seen, not just leave you hanging. Does that make sense? And what I've seen, and in, in, in guys, and, I'm, and, I'm, and once again, guys, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not Jeremiah, it's Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 13. Let's look at Deuteronomy 13. 
Jeremiah was the pastor. That's not like, hold on. Deuteronomy 13. Let me go back to my notes here. Deuteronomy 13 is all about false prophets. Now, I want you to know that there could be false apostles, false prophets, false evangelists, false pastors, and false teachers. I want you all to know that. Please know that. Not everybody who says they are who they are are who they say they are. How do we know if somebody is who they say they are? We use what as a standard? The word, the word of God, okay? False prophets. Um, Deuteronomy 13.1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and give it thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, let us go after other gods. You see how he's using his, his success? But where is he leading you? To other gods. Let us go after other gods who thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord of God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he had spoken to turn you away from the Lord God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou be put, put this evil away from the midst of thee. So if a prophet gives you some prophecy that takes you away from the plan of God, or being able to preach the gospel like not being able to pay your bills, walk away from that prophet. Since 1995, so that your cancer and all your debt can be canceled. Please keep your money at home. If you want to give your money away, the chocolate at Antioch, we have some ways we can use your money. And don't worry about cancer. Don't worry about debt because I'm also going to teach you how to live cancer-free and live debt-free. Right here at the church, all that's happening. Be a good steward. Over your money. Don't spend more than you make. It's, it's not hard. Oh, God, I'm believing for a car. Believe for a job first. Amen. See, it's about order. Do everything decent in order. You can't have a Maserati with Chevy money. It's just... It don't work. I, I didn't learn that in church. I learned that from my grandmother, who was who was not the most saved person. <laughs> my grandmother used to say, "You can't have champagne taste with beer money." That's just, just that's the way we learned it. And so we saw diamonds and things. We said, "Oh, our money ain't there yet." But now, with credit, <laughs> you signing up for four hundred and ninety. You went down to the quick clap, quick cash, gave up your title for four hundred and twenty three percent interest rate. Legal loan shark. And the prophets are no different. The false prophets are no different. You want to pack out a church? Put out advertising that the prophet coming. Oh, they'd be everywhere. Say an evangelist coming? You can throw a brick and not hit nobody. Because <laughs> people don't like correction. They don't like truth. The flesh don't want truth. The flesh want to be at peace. Oh, I see you. Oh, I see you. Oh, 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 oh. I see. What you see? What you see? What you see? Let me come to the meeting. He don't see nothing. That's why he's stalling. Take me with you to the prophetic conference. I bet you won't have so much fun. Because I'm going to tell you if you're God or not. Because it's going to lie to God's word. And it's going to come to pass in your life. Then the prophet will come in. Oh, I see great terror coming to y'all. Oh, I see great terror. Does that line up with what the prophet's supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. How you see all this terror? What you mean? Terror cause? Let me get back to my message. Y'all good? Yes. yes. Hmm. Some people will struggle with this type of teaching on a Sunday morning. I thank God for y'all maturity that y'all can take it because some people want to hear about Jesus. How many of y'all know about Jesus? Show sure, hands, please. This is just for the internet audience. We have taught Jesus here at the chapel at Antioch. We are moving on in Jesus now. Let, could y'all raise your hands again just so they know y'all know? He came, he died, he rose again for your sake. He's got all power in his hand. Hold your hands up. You know, it's, it's kind of slow. Y'all's got a delayed thing on that. So, y'all see it? Until the Lord upgrades. We ain't going to spend no money because we can't afford the equipment and sit it out there like that. Not yet. But we're going to get them. All right? They've been taught Jesus. So they know the story of Jesus. And if you haven't been taught the story of Jesus, come back. We got you. I'm going to tell you what to look at. I'm, I want you to get the story of Jesus. I want you to go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They tell the story just as it happened. Jesus wants you to be saved. He wants you to know he gave his life for you. Jesus wants you in the kingdom of God, the family of God. He wants you eternally with him in heaven. Yes, 
He is a forgiver of your sin. He is the love of your soul. But you need a pastor. You need a leader. You need to find an apostle, an evangelist, a prophet, a teacher. Somebody need to teach you how to live out Christianity. And that's Amen. what we're doing here at the chapel at Antioch. Come on, give God a hand for it. The apostle. The apostle is the sent out ones. Matthew 10, 1 says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power. Now notice, when he called them, they were what? Disciples. They had a certain level of discipline, equivalent to that of an elder. They had certain disciplines. That's why they're called disciples. So Matthew 10, 1, And when he had called unto him twelve disciples, he gave them power. The minute they get power, they become apostles. Because now he's about to send them out. They're not just disciples because disciples are called to, but apostles are sent out from. So here he says he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. Now, see this verse 2. Now the name of the 12 apostles are these. And then in verse 4 so goes on through all 12 of the names of the apostles. Fast forward to verse 5. Notice. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying. Now remember, when we started out with the teacher, the teacher was allowed doubt. When Jesus sends an apostle out, he commands them, this is what you must do. Ain't no doubt for an apostle. You got to go. This is what you got to do. And you say, well, what about Thomas? Thomas doubted. Jesus helped him out real quick, didn't he? Go not into the way of Gentiles and to any city of the Samaritans, into ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely did. Now, this notion that the apostle has to be broke, busted, and disgusted comes from the next few words of Matthew 10. Let's look at it. Matthew 10, because people got the idea that the preacher and the we just supposed to just not have nothing. That's nothing can be further from the truth. In verse 8, he says, Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you receive, freely give. Then verse 9, provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And to whatever city or town you enter it, inquire who is worthy, and there abide till you go hence, thence, so forth and so on. Notice Jesus says, don't take no money with you. Now let's flip over to Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 35. He says, and he said unto them, when I sent you without personal script and shoes, did you lack anything? The reason they didn't have to take anything with them is because Jesus provided everything for them. Plus they worked jobs, okay? He says, and they said nothing. Verse 36, then said he to them, but now. He that had the purse, let him take it. And likewise, his script. And he had no sword. Notice here. Jesus didn't allow them to take a weapon. He didn't allow them to defend themselves. They threw themselves into a position where they were martyrs. Why? Because they were helping Jews come out of, uh, of, of, of the law. And the Jews are only going to be persuaded if they can endure the persecution that was going to come their way. So Jesus said, don't even defend yourself. He said, but now... He that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this is written must be yet accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For this thing concerning me had an end. Jesus says the reason I sent you out like that is so that you can only depend on me. But now we're coming to a different place in this thing. You're going to need to have some money. You're going to need to have a coat. You're going to need to have a garment. You're going to need some things. You're apostles. You're going to have to do what I did for you now. Ah, oh, hallelujah. Now the apostle has to be what Jesus was to them. They must be to the people they oversee. So there must be something in the, the apostle's possession so that when people have need, the apostle is able to distribute. This is an apostolic ministry. This is why God allows people from other cities to sow into our ministry so that we can get done what God has called us to do. Right now we're saving I'm going to share something with you guys. We have 
last year we had a goal. I'm not going to give you all the dollar amount because I don't want anybody to get off. But I'll tell you this. Last year we had a goal. It took us 12 months to reach that goal. By the time we reached the goal in 12 months, it was 2,000 over that goal. The board saw it. They said, my God, Pastor D, y'all did it. Y'all did it. Oh, glory to God. The board was excited. Then y'all came back and said, let's begin to give pastor a salary. The board said, we've been wanting to do it. But I saw what God was saying. If I took a salary, we didn't even make the goal. So now we're ready. So we set another goal for this year. We already meet the goal in the first month of ministry. We got to have another board meeting. Because what we said we would say has already been done in the first month of this year. We're in apostolic ministry. God makes sure we have everything we need. And guess what? I got friends and God bless my brothers. I am praying for the people. They pastor to see it the way you all have seen it. Because we haven't missed one payment of anything. We don't owe nobody for nothing. Everything in here is paid for. When we go out to look for stuff, it's half off, 75% off free. Here, take it. God blesses us because we are, we are obedient to what we see in this word. You ain't see me trying to get on TV. Oh, I think I should be on TV and that. Yeah. I look better than all the other preachers. They didn't see that. Some of these billboards I see in drivers and they didn't know they shouldn't be up there on that billboard. <laughs> Just smile. <laughs> Just get out. You're a distraction. Just put a bottle up. <laughs> you didn't see us do that. You see that one little sign with me and Michelle out there. The Lord, we wrestled with that, didn't we? The Lord says they need to see. And then Ryan confirmed it. The Spirit of the Lord came on Ryan one day. He said, Pastor, you don't want to put your picture on nothing. I said, I don't, Ryan. He said, but Pastor, nobody know you're Ryan. We need to be able to identify people, Ryan. And I went home after Ryan's word. I said, oh, God. The little spirit little jumped on him again. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, is this you? And it was the Lord. And so I had to go find a happy looking picture. <laughs> and that's it. We've only done two flyers. We did the first flyer. We did 50. How long did we do? 100? I think it was 100 or something flyers like that, right? We didn't do a whole lot of them. Me, me Michelle, Andrea, and Ryan, and Jasmine passed out all the flyers. You know, we're a whole lot of five people passed them all out. I still got some in the car. Ryan still got some in the car. We still got some in the back. So we didn't even pass them all out. <laughs> and then our second one, we only did it digital. It was only online. We did it in print. It was an anniversary. Those are only two advertisements we've done. But we got over 128 contributors to the ministry. It's apostolic. How is that? Because God is taking care of this stuff. Why? The apostle lays a foundation. Do you not think we're not laying a good foundation? We lay a foundation in the Word of God. That's what a foundation is. Not my personality and her personality and my good looks and her good looks. No. We are laying a foundation in the Word of God. For the perfecting, the maturing of the saints. We don't want baby Christians for the next 20 years of our life. We can't listen here. Let me, let me, let me help y'all. The stuff we're dealing with now, if I'm dealing with 20 years, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to deal with you. <laughs> if you don't know your bed is your bed and I got to keep coming to get you out of other folks' bed, I'm going to do that maybe once or twice and really help you. Now, you know you don't belong in any bed. But now, 20 years from now, you're still in the wrong bed. I'm going to give you some duct tape and a script on pen. And I'm going to tell you, write your name on your bed. That's the bed you sleep in. And I'm going to be done with you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, the nursing home is the highest rate of sexually transmitted disease. I'm going to come out there and write your name on your bed. <laughs> Yeah, the singers get to the end, Doc. <laughs> I did a study years ago on sexually transmitted diseases by populace. Senior citizens' homes were the worst. Yeah, yeah. senior citizens' homes was, was the cesspool of sexually transmitted diseases. How your mama get? How your mama get clapped? <laughs> Can't picture that. And that's, that, thank you, Kent, for this. But watch this. Maturing of the saints is the work of the ministry. An apostle cannot be self-made. An apostle must be sent out from somewhere. 
I shared that with you all in the beginning of this ministry. I didn't just come here. I was sent out by Bishop E. James Logan and Bishop Daryl Lynn Hines. They lay hands on Michelle and I and they say, go, this is the will of God. We're not self-made pastors. We just didn't get some bright idea. And to anybody who thinks you have a call into one of these ministry gifts, you need to be sent out from one of these ministry gifts because it gives you a validity back all the way to Jesus. I'm, the reason I'm confident because I know I am of Jesus Christ. Not just because of bishop, but I can go back and keep on going back to Jesus. Somebody had to follow Jesus. And that's how I ended up. Somebody who is self-made. Let me help y'all out with this whole self-made idea. Because yeah. that's real popular in y'all, this new generation. Y'all hear that term a lot. I'm self-made. You a lie. Yeah. If you read a book, dummy, the person who put the information in the book is your teacher. To be self-made means you got to sit there and come up with everything from origin to conception by yourself. <laughs> I'm a self-made millionaire. No, you're not. Somebody made records. Somebody created recordings. Somebody showed you how to do it. You did it. You made a record. Then you went to a distributor. You got distribution. And somebody produced it. And they put out an album. It's a whole lot of people that made you. Because without them, you and your smart self couldn't do all that. I'm self-made millionaire. No, you didn't. I don't even talk about stuff you probably did get there. <laughs> the apostle must have the qualifications of an elder. The apostle will have spiritual authority. Now, let me help you all with this apostolic authority. Bishop E. James Logan is my bishop. He's my pastor. He is my father in, in the Lord. I love him. Love him. But he not going to come in here and say, I don't like these red seat tunnels. Get rid of them. That ain't, ain't going to happen. You go, you go back on Christian faith, Dad. You leave, you leave us alone. But if I get out of line with the teachings of God, and I begin to teach you something that's going to take away from God, and he hears of it, and all of a sudden on a Sunday morning he shows up, and he says, let me show you Pastor Donnell, is guiding you all to idols. He has authority to do that. Amen. He does. Now, fortunately for you, you don't have to worry about that. Praise God. And <laughs> I don't want to die. Go to hell. Go to him. You ain't got to worry about me misleading y'all. Hell is too hot and forever is too long. Remember that. Amen. Tweet that. <laughs> Why you living say hell is too hot and forever too long? <laughs> This is another big one, and I'm wrapping up. Apostles are typically relational. Isn't that different from what we see in the apostolic gifts today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're not relational. In the Bible, they were very relational. Mm -hmm. They were relational. When Jesus sent out the apostles, he sent them out two by two. You think they, you think they went into countries and cities, and then a thousand people show up, and they just depended on each other? Or did they get in there and mix it up with the people? They had to mix it up with the people. They had to be able to come tell Jesus who was sick, who was poor, who was broke, who was going through, who was lying, who was cheating. They had, and they had to get to know people. That's why we spend so much money on fellowship because it's apostolic to know each other. How dare you be sick and nobody in here know it? Well, I was just going through myself. I didn't want to burden nobody. Don't listen. Don't let the devil trick you. You're not a burden. You're sick. You're weak. Let, let he the sick call for the elders. And when they pray the prayer of faith, the Lord will heal their body. Don't suffer in silence. I'm telling all y'all. I'm telling you right now. Ain't no secrets. Well, I don't want everybody to know. Well, the devil know. He going to beat you up at that hospital. You sit up there by yourself. Oh, because I'm going to tell you. You may. <laughs> I've done that. I don't want everybody to know my business. Then you get to the hospital. You're there by yourself by day two. Now show when somebody comes see you. <laughs> Nut, you. You didn't tell nobody. Now, I'm smart enough not to get mad at folks for not coming to see me. But some folks get an offense. Didn't nobody even come and check on me. I was gone for a month. Well, people leave all the time. <laughs> we supposed to chase you down? You're not relational. That's not on the church. That's on you. We are apostolic ministry. Does that mean we're the apostolic denomination? Everybody say with me, no. Because yeah. if you go according to the apostolic denominational rules, they they have some crazy, crazy stuff going on, and we just ain't gonna participate in it. Amen. Yeah, all yeah, all y'all. 
y'all, y'all women wearing jeans and all this color and lipstick, and all this, and you out of here. Yeah. All you men that's not sitting on the front row. Yeah. We're not that. Don't worry. So the women got the women can't cut their hair. So the apostle is Ross says ready, sound in doctrine, clothed in humility. He's noted for his patience. Jesus was a great apostle. Man, do you know how patient Jesus was? Think about Peter. Remember we went through that last year, Peter? And Jesus just kept on. <laughs> Peter, man, Peter cut the man ear off. <laughs> but he, had, he, he was right there. Was, Peter heard Luke 22 live. How many swords we got? None. Oh, uh, one. Two. No, he said two. Jesus said that'll be enough. Peter was like, yeah. <laughs> cut the man ear off. Malchus ear. And Jesus said, put it back on Peter. Don't, this got to happen, Peter. Stop. Peter cussed the woman out. Jesus was patient. And Peter made it. <laughs> the apostle is the sent one. Now, I'll close with this, this guys. Within our ministry, we have been blessed. All five of these ministry gifts at some point or another has worked here. They flow here. The anointing on my life is to minister these gifts. If you feel as though the Lord is calling you to some area in ministry, I need you to meditate and pray until you know what that is. And I'm not talking about 10 minutes. Take a day. Take a week. Take a month. Meditate on it. Take notes of what you hear. Then go back over your notes to see if it lines up until you come up with this idea, this image, or this concept of what you believe God is saying. We will pray about it together. But for those of you all that are calling to walk in one of these ministry gifts, I need to know who you are so that as we grow as a ministry, we can make sure that in our planning, we say, okay, we have a person who will fit here. We have a person who will fit here. Um, that's already started to happen too, by the way, guys. That's already started to happen. Some of you I've talked to you as what I feel the Lord is leading you. Others I'm still praying um, on what to do. And I know some of you are meditating. I had a wonderful conversation. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago, me, you had a conversation about, wonderful conversation with Valerie as it relates to what God was going to let her do and call her to be able to do. And I, I just said, Valerie, I believe we should just keep meditating on it. Let's, let's pray that thing through. Lacey, I talked with Lacey, and it's so beautiful to watch God pull you. God is not pushing you, Lacey. He's pulling you because you wouldn't come. But now he's like, I got you. And now you, I can see there's so much slack in the rope. It used to be tension in the rope, but now it's slack in the rope because you're moving towards it now. And it's good. That's, it's just beautiful to watch. See, your mother talked about last night. I had already heard a word from the Lord that mother would be the person who goes to the hospital and prays with those that are in the hospital. Now, fortunately, right now, we don't have anybody in the hospital. God. Praise God. <laughs> we don't have that. Praise God. We don't have no sick and no shut in as you, right now. But, but we have mother who prays already for those people. In the, see, we're about preventive. We want to keep you out of the hospital. Amen. Yeah. We want to keep you out the shut in list. We want you out, free, breathing. Go, 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 go to farms. Just think about Mary. Go to farms. It's a buffet moment. But, but we got a mother there. We'll pray. So something the Lord says something to me. Try to remember. As your pastor, there'll be things that I start off with you in. Pastor Michelle, I, I talked to you and Lacey about that. But there'll be areas and times we start off with you in ministry, wherever you feel you're called to serve. We'll be right there by your side. But at some point, we're going to be apostolic and send you by yourself, and you're going to be able to handle it. You'll have the confidence. Don't be crying. You go, you leave. Like, look here today, kid. You know, don't leave me. Don't leave me. <laughs> yeah, you'll have that for a day or two, but my goodness, if you have it after a year, I'm going to say, this ain't where you belong. Amen. Have you all been blessed today? Yes. This is good. Sober, right? No running, no shouting, no jumping. We, we just got it. If you, didn't, you need to run, shout, and jump, you got your house. Tell that joint up. Go for it. Turn the music up loud as you want to. Today's message was sobering. There is a leader for everyone. God is so faithful to us, guys. He makes sure. Yes, Mother? I have a question. Please, Mother. Uh, how different should know where to sing and to, to The Lord spoke it to me. The Lord spoke to me. I had an iPad, Mother. I had a dream. I told you about the dream. The dream was <clears throat> people praying, Lord, I'm sick of church, but I'm not sick of you. It started off with one voice. 
And then it was multiple voices. And it was just a collaboration of voices. And they were all saying the same thing. And the way I, I hear things, I have very good hearing. I heard all these different voices saying the same thing. And when I woke up, I was crying. And I woke up and I said, God, why did you let me hear that? Why? Why? He says, they're praying for a pastor. And you're him. But they don't know. I pulled out my iPad and I pulled up a map. And I said, God, I got my passport. I'll go anywhere in the world. But remember, I got Michelle with me. Because <laughs> I was thinking the Lord would send me to Mexico or somewhere. But I said, remember, Michelle, she don't do well over there. <laughs> and um, I just kind of swiped it. I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere in the world. And it landed on America. And, and more, it landed on Tennessee. And Antioch was bigger than Nashville and Memphis and Jackson. Antioch was bigger. And Antioch is a place in the scriptures where the people were first called Christians. And it just stuck out to me that Antioch I had never heard of, even though I lived in Jackson and been to Nashville and Memphis, I'd never heard of Antioch. So I said to Michelle, have you ever heard of Antioch? She said, a little town I drove to there, going to Murphy, Murphy's Girl. She went to college at MTSU. She said, it's a little town. And I looked at it. He says, that's where you're going. And I prayed about it for a year. And after a year, I was at a funeral. My friend's uh, mother was killed in a car accident. And I was working in ministry. And I had to oversee the process of her funeral. And um, Bishop was so impressed with how the funeral was done. He was just really impressed. The order of service. We got to the burial on time. We did Listen. You know, at funerals, I don't know if you all have this. It's a cultural thing, but they have a two-minute remark for friends and family to come up and say something before the eulogy. Let me tell you right now, I took that out of the service. That was so different because you always got to tell people they're going over their time. It makes things uncomfortable because now cousin want to talk about the time when we was little and we we was throwing rocks at the river and then they going over and they three minutes over then they say dumb stuff like. I'm his cousin. I know I get more than two minutes. And it's like, it just creates. So what I did was, I worked with the family and we took that portion all the way out of the service. And said, if you have remarks, you can speak them to the family at the uh, repast. At, yeah, y'all can do that when they eat at home. And every elder, every leader was like, no, he didn't. I got into the car with Bishop to go to the graveyard. He said, Donnie Cole, <laughs> this was the best funeral. <laughs> I, uh, this was timely. It was on. It was orderly. The people got the word of God. I was able to minister. It was no conflict. He said, "Man." Now I had not told him about Antioch. He said, "Man, I got to send you to Tennessee." He said, "Memphis." He said, "You're gonna be." He said, "You're gonna be the pastor of the church of Memphis," and I sit in the back seat. And I mumbled, no, I ain't Memphis. <laughs> he said, what? I said, well, it's Tennessee, but it ain't Memphis. He looked back at me. He said, I know. I know. We're going to talk. We went to the cemetery. And he looked at me. He just stared at me. He's like, the Lord has already prepared me. I got to let you go. He said, I've been dealing with it for about a year. <laughs> At a grave He says, come and see me Tuesday. I sat down with him Tuesday. I said, this is what the Lord has shown me. He says, are you going to carry the church name? We went to, uh, we went to, uh, we went to a restaurant. He says, are you going to carry on Christian Faith Fellowship Church? Because it's the same church. And I had my head down. I looked him right now. I said, no. That's not what God told me. He said, what you got? the chapel. And the logo was the word the chapel and the A was for all God's people in the one room. And I explained that to him. He said, that's God. And then what you got to understand a lot of fringe benefits that had I saved as a Christian Faith Fellowship Church 
there were a lot of fresh benefits that would come along with my ministry. Startup money, uh, support monthly. All that, that would have came through the ministry. They would have paid, they would have handled all of our uh, business. They would have did all that, like setting up the church, setting up payroll, setting up housing allowance. They would have did all of that had I stayed under Christian Faith Fellowship Church. But when I said no, it was on me and her. I think we raised something like $55,000. Most of that was our own money. God blessed us to sell two properties and profit from both of them. We invited 75 friends of ours to a white party. And we told them, you remember that one? We invited them and said, come in. We want to present to you our ministry. We want to ask you to be a part of it. And that day we had, man, I think we had some like six or seven thousand dollars started giving. We have people say, we uh, we have people say this, Mother Lily. I want to pay your first month's rent. I want to pay you. And, you. and we gave them the breakdown of everything will cost, every sound system, all of this stuff. We said this costs this. This is I got that. I start getting phone calls. Purchase starting church. Um, O'Brien Schofield, football player. He purchased all. Him and his wife purchased all the sound equipment and all the video equipment. He says, Dad, don't let nobody else get in on that. I want to pay for all of that. First three months of rent. They paid our first month's rent here.
Love you. Aaron Traker has given time, effort, and love to the chaplain and Antioch and Puck to being recognized for the use of his gift of music and ministry for the past year. We are forever grateful for his abilities and his talents in the areas of music ministry for the chaplain and Antioch and his family. Morgan Moore has given effort and inspiration to the members of the chaplain at Antioch this public for being recognized for her hard work and dedication to accomplishing her goals for the past year. We are forever grateful for her constant example of dedication to a healthy lifestyle here at the chaplain at Antioch and his family. And last but definitely not least, Joshua Ashley has given time and effort to lo and love to the chaplain at Antioch for being publicly recognized for the using of his gift of music and ministry for the past year. The Presbyterian is forever grateful for the use of his abilities and talents in the areas of audio engineering for the chaplain. <laughs> That's what he's going to school for. But he's using his gift right here. We don't love you. Love you. The Bible says give honor to where honor is due. Now, there are so many more of you guys that we're going to honor. Those are the ones who have really put forth effort last year. Don't ever feel like, well, they didn't give us nothing. No, these people really went above and beyond. Don't ever let that creep in. Don't ever let that creep in. I will tell you this, Pastor D, I don't celebrate holidays, Hallmark days. I, let me tell y'all how I think. I don't celebrate Valentine's Day because it's my endeavor to be good all the time. Bless you. 